thank you for inviting me here. Um, the issues of flooding that we had uh, this, this winter um, showed just how powerful nature is. It, it was almost calamitous uh, in areas. And a lot of people have looked to the reasons behind why we had flooding. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of, going to be lots of good academic grants on this. The problem is, as the reasons why flooding happens, there's a lot of vested interests, there's a lot of politics. And at the time, um, people like myself were trying to say, well, we've been, conservationists have been talking about this for decades, that we are messing with our floodplain. Um, the issues of climate change, which are complicated and very hard to prove, but things to a, a land-based conservationist like myself, is we've completely messed <coughs> with our land. And it's obvious that we're going to have problems because of it. And it was sad to see that, the, that such a flooding event created such a political uproar because the people who captured that were the very people who caused the problem in the first place. And that is the industrial farming system we have in this country. And the people who benefit from that, the economic systems that created that farming system, the legal codes of land ownership. And they were the first there with their little pay officers saying we must have even more money. We caused the problem, but to solve it, we must have more money. Sub towns, you've got to protect my farm. And that's what I think is uh, the central issue. So in my talk, I want to talk about flooding and rainfall history, a little bit about the science, what science is um, available. I want to talk about water catchments, what we've done. We've sheep-wrecked our uplands in the last couple of hundred years. We've destroyed, and it's getting worse, not better. It is appalling. And because we don't understand the history of the ecology of this country, we don't understand what we've actually done to our country. We've wrecked the natural habitats, uh, the uplands, the water catchments. We've also straightjacketed our streams and rivers. We've turned natural living entities into drainage channels. And that causes worse problems with flooding. And all of the massacre of wildlife we've done and the process of doing it, all at taxpayers' expense. Then I'm going to give you some examples. The first is the Blue Room, um, Blau Karma, if your um, Dutch is up to it. Um, and this is a place I visited about 14 years ago, where we imported our first ever conic ponies, the wild horses, the last of the wild horses of Europe, the top hat. And this is a fascinating study of what happened um, in, on the Rhine in, in Holland. And then I want to talk about people trying to create artificial beaver habitat. And why, why would you spend millions of pounds on creating an artificial beaver habitat when you could just release some beaver? <laughs> then we'll have some thoughts on global warming. And then we want to pull it all together with why are these happenings? What are the economic underpinnings of these issues going on? And if we understand the economics of land use and water, then we can understand the true solution to the problem. Because the solution is not a bunch of conservationists waving green flags saying, please protect our animals, protect our rivers. The solutions to our problem are the fundamental economic forces at play that are creating, that are turning every person in this country into a wildlife destroyer, while changing the economic topology of our system could turn everybody in this country into a wildlife conservationist, whether they are green, like nature, or not. So, what happened? What's all the science behind this is the, the nice famous photograph of Boss Castle where, um, where we had this mass flooding event and threatening people's lives. What, what happened here? Is it because rainfall was higher? 
Well, if we study the statistics I've reviewed, you can see that there have been definitely changes of patterns in the last 30 years in rainfall. But when you extend to 100 years, where the, the data is not such good quality, you can't see a change in rainfall patterns. So the, the, the scientific community, the best models of understanding rainfall in this country, it's still out. There's definitely been some clustering effects of high rainfall, intense rainfall events in the last few years. And that, that, that can be, you know, good papers have been written on that. But we don't know if this is a long-term trend. It's a bit like global warming. It's hard from a snapshot of 20 years with the date we've got, it's hard to ascertain. But I still don't think this event was caused by a particularly high, a particularly unusual rainfall event. There are many rainfall events that happened at Boss Castle. The reason why this town flooded so terribly is because all of the farmers in the uplands around there had little diggers and dug drainage ditches to drain the land so they could put more sheep and get more money on the fields. And if you go back 200 years to the moors, it wasn't like that. It wasn't full of sheep. It was full of trees. So in the space of five or six generations, we've destroyed that habitat that would protect these towns from flooding. And now the rain pour falls down. It shoots across compact soils that have been eaten bare and flies off into rivers and now threatens to flood towns. And the poor flood defense guys at the Environment Agency are fighting a losing battle because it's a shifting. So we've got, and rivers themselves have been channeled as we've got more machines and organizations to look. Your rivers have stopped meandering. Where's the oxbow lakes? Where's the complex? habitats along rivers anymore. They've gone because we actually, our taxes pay for rivers to be straightened and channeled and stop being natural and free and creating uh, rich wetlands around. And we've lost those wetlands on the sides of rivers as we've economically exploited them. So that water shoots down those rivers to our towns even faster. There is a sheep wrecked landscape cannot absorb water, the rain falls upon the hills, the sheep have compacted the soil, laid it bare, and no longer can we have a giant sponge. And the soils have all oxidized into the atmosphere, all the carbon has gone. There we see an agricultural dike burned. So now that river, it can't flood. So what happens to the water when we get lots of rainfall? If it can't go into the surrounding fields, it goes on into the town or the next farmer's fields. And putting higher bones and dredging your river just pushes the water, even more water, a little further down. So when people clamor, I want to dredge ditches, get this government dredge my ditch, what they're saying is, save my field, salt the next guy. And then we've got changes, not just in upland farming, not just on rivers. We have got a completely changed agricultural system. Here we see a wonderful field of maize. And of American corn. And the system of planting these maize crops means you get massive runoff. All the pollution, the phosphates, the nitrates, all the pesticides, massive amounts of pesticides. I mean, this, we're now growing corn, and that's mostly used for animal feed, so we can have cheaper McDonald's. Or it's going into biofuels. It actually takes more inputs to create the oil, to create those crops and pesticides, fertilizers, the tractors that use it, than the oil you get out the end. Yet still, our taxes and our laws are saying we must do it. And all the landowners who get the rent from the land and all of the companies, the agricultural companies, are going, <laughs> marvellous job this, I get loads of money. 
and we're wrecking our land. The whole size structure is being destroyed. It'll reduce fertility in the future, which means people, all the farmers have to buy even more fertilizers and pesticides. And that's going on everywhere. Look at what happens on farmland today. It's not managed by a farmer anymore. Most landowners have got nothing to do with farming. They sign a contract and a management company that runs about you know, 20 or 30 farmers' fields now manage it on a very, very industrial basis. And this happens more and more. If you walk into the countryside now, most of it has been managed. Some of these companies have been floated on stock exchanges and they're, they're doing strange and wonderful things with the ownership of land to avoid taxes. There's all kinds of strange things that go on with the way we farm today. So the, uh, when the NFU put this nice little lady farmer from Devon to talk, oh, my poor cows, I should batch it. That's just a PR exercise. Most farming today in this country is incredibly intensive. It's an industrial scale process. And they are constantly lobbying government to reduce the regulations on soil protection, which we've seen, on how these crops are, are managed so that they are robbing our future. They are robbing the quality of the land in the future for short-term gain today. Let me tell you about room for the river. My Dutch is non-existent. If we have any Dutch speakers, they can pronounce that for me. Um, and this all involves, when I was a younger conservationist, going off to, and you can actually watch it on YouTube, because the BBC did a documentary with a, a film crew with us when we went over there. And we went to get our first wild horses to bring back to wild our beautiful horses. And we were introduced to the Dutch thinking of the horses are bred by Chenska Lubak. Ooh, Peter right. from the Kent Wildlife Trust has helped to raise some cash and they are buying 12 horses. Friendly and right. For wild horses. The town of Renan. Lovely town. Very nice. Dutch. Really know about town planning. I mean, they do. Nice houses. Nice people. Lovely cycle paths. And then, if we come down here, is Blau Karma. That means blue room. And the blue room is there. And it is a blue room in a house. It's a restaurant. And this area here, we'll see it better in a minute, was all farmed. And you can see all this area is intensively farmed. The Dutch are incredibly good at farming. They farm their land more intensively than we do. Um, but this is the Nijmegen, where the, the Rhine splits up and there are three channels in there. And there's a lot of water comes down that river. And they built flood defences along the river. They've also got flood defences along here. One is to stop winter floods, and the other was to stop summer floods. So when they stop the summer floods along here, they could farm this low-lying floodplain, which they did. Unfortunately, when you do that, if you imagine, you've got a, I haven't got a diagram, but if you imagine you've got a little bunt here, and the there, it floods, it fills up the silt. So the total area of your floodplain reduces. And what happens when you get all the the flood waters at winter comes out, it now tops over your existing flood defences when it never did before. And in the case of Renin, it killed people, precisely some school children. And it caused a massive furore. So they had to investigate how they could stop that happening again. Where was the best place to stop the poor town flooding again? And the answer they came up with was not to pour concrete or build bigger buns next to the town, but to rewild the Blau Karma nature of that. So they took the land from the farmers and they re-profiled the area. They actually used the clay for their, their seed flood defences. And they needed some animals to do this. Because just taking down the flood defences wasn't enough. You had to create an area that could absorb the floodwaters, to slow it down, to calm the raging torrent. And you couldn't just do it by yourself. There's a lovely aerial shot. This is Blau Karma in the flood. So it's not always in the summer. Of course, not like this. The water drains out slowly. And 
it is a beautiful, spectacular sight. I mean, I, I can tell you lots of fantastic creatures I saw down there. And, um, but they needed to manage that land, to make it into a giant sponge that had fantastic benefits for everybody in Holland. Not only did it absorb the floodwaters, it actually released the water then slowly back. So therefore, you, the river was buffered. And that helped wildlife in the river as well. And it created a beautiful nature reserve. There is a, a shot inside the nature reserve. So we've zoomed in. You can see this is what rewilding is. It's about letting habitat retake hold. But you can't let it go to a climactic community because then it wouldn't absorb the water. So you need some of these guys, conic ponies, wild horses dashing through the beautiful wetlands, munching away, changing the vegetation structure, helping lay down peaty soils that will act as your giant sponge and protect the town. This horse is one of the horses we brought back from Holland on Stadmarsh National Nature Reserve in Kent, doing exactly the same job, cutting the costs of nature conservation. You don't need people to do things. These beautiful horses, we've now got 140 of them on nature reserves around Britain, doing similar jobs. And we've, we've got a new project just starting outside Brighton with um, the council. And we're, I do about two new projects every year where we try to establish. We've already done two this year, so I've, I've already met my quota. We've done one in Wales. But these horses are fire and forget conservation devices. Apart from you've got to look after their genetics and stuff like that. They can live in all kinds of habitats. And they hold within them the last of the genes of the tarpan, the wild British horse, and the wild European horse. And you can see upon their legs they've got striping, like quagga. They're really cool. And they're lovely animals. I absolutely love them. So, the artificial beaver. Up where I hail from in Northumberland, they came up with another wonderful idea to help stop flood defences. There there is, and there's some council officials in the town of Belford. And that's what happens to Belford. It's only been happening in the last 10, 15 years. Never used to happen. That's a bit odd. So the clever people at Newcastle University and the Environment Agency came up with a cracking scheme. We're not going to put in hard flood defences. We're going to try to do this softly. They are going to create beaver-like structures that hold water all along the catchment. Now, if you go to the catchment, I actually come very close from there, you'll see that the farmers have been doing what modern farming do, intensifying the land, making sure that the land is well drained, and that's why you've got the water gushing off into Belfort and flooding it. So they looked to create a strategic set of imitation beaver structures of ponds, dams, obstructions to the flow of water. And this was studied very well. We've got some wonderful monitoring equipment and they've proved this helps alleviate flooding. And you can see they've created little artificial beaver ponds. They've created fallen trees to trap water. They've created complex structures, you can't quite see this resolution, it to slow down rivers, to allow the water to percolate into subsoils, to, to ease that raging torrent when it flows hard. You have to ask the question, why didn't they just put beavers there and saved all the millions of pounds they just spent? And that's an honest question. It's, it's, why not? Well, we have been working, I've been working for 15 years, over 15 years, to get beavers back from this country. And we did the first project at Ham Fen, where we introduced beavers, to save the last remaining Fenland in the southeast, the proper Fenland. And they've done a stunning job. This is the first beaver habit I saw, habitat I saw in Germany, took a photograph. That's an intensively farmed field, and that's what a beaver can do in just three years create a beautiful wetland. Ooh, I think I've missed off. And if you look at what they've done at Ham Fen, they've done a beautiful job of creating from what was a drained peatland, they've pushed channels out into the side of the, the river and it's all hydrated and you've created a beautiful wetland that now absorbs water. 
and stops the neighboring farms from flooding. So they shouldn't be too happy. So I wanted to talk about global warming and some thoughts about global warming. Because it's very hard to think about global warming because it's a complex issue. The areas of global warming I've been interested, interested in, and because I used to do computer modeling and I was a bit of a nerd, I get my spreadsheet out now and again. And I like running a few numbers. If we have a look at where carbon is in our ecosphere, where does it live? We know that the biggest source of carbon, of course, is in the oceans. But that's deep. The stuff that has atmospheric use in recycling in the upper surface is about a thousand gigatons. We've obviously got fossil carbon, which is actually really important on a geological scale. If you look at climate change on, on, on a geological scale, exposure of um, carbon in rock is actually one of the most important features. It is just as important as our orbit on other things around the sun. Really important. But, you know, we're not going to hopefully have the exposure of the, um, the um, volcano beds of Siberia, which collapsed our whole ecology. Soil carbon, 2,300 gigahertz. This gig gigatons, this is the interesting carbon. What are we doing to our soils? And the models that people have made in climate have not shown what are we doing to the carbon in our soils because we are releasing a stupefying amount of it into the atmosphere by changing land use. In fact, the models I've seen um, do not fully model what's been happening in the world. The drainage of tropical wetlands for, um, for farming and what we've done to our own country over the last couple of hundred years. We've released, released a lot of carbon and that could be a lot more than what we're using in fossil fuels. And it needs a lot more research. So there'll be some work in that if any of you into that kind of modeling. So compared to human emissions, and to compare to the, the cycles of carbon that we're going on, the big hidden picture is what we're doing to our soils. And I think that's going to be really interesting in the future. Something I've looked at is if we have a look at this carbon content of different soils, and this is to do with rewilding, we start off with a farmer's field. An arable field could have 1.4 tonnes per hectare. Moving on to woodland, plantation woodland 85, ancient woodland about 100. You think trees should have a lot of carbon, shouldn't you? Big tree. You've got poor soil structures, so they've actually got relatively small amounts of carbon locked into their habitat. We move on to heathland, dwarf scrub. Dwarf scrub is interesting to me because that is the rewilded habitat. We want to create a rich mixture of different types of um, dwarf scrub, climactic communities, and grasslands. You then move on to some of the more ancient forms of grassland have actually got a load more carbon in them. Then we move on to wetland, normal wetland, you can have 500 tonnes per hectare, and wet woodland, great rewilded habitat, wet woodland, beavers will create that. But let me press this button one more time. Peatland has gone off the graph. It's because I'm using a 4x3 instead of a 19x9. Peatland, there should be a thing here, that says 5,000 tonnes per hectare. Right? And that's what we've been getting rid of. And that's what beavers can create along every riverbank and certain upland systems and brick. A massive carbon store that, when you run the numbers, could actually absorb all the carbon humans create in this country. Beavers only work in some habitat, doesn't work in others, but in this UK, if we reintroduced beaver, had them on every riverbank, and then looked at their sequestration of carbon, it would actually be greater than that which all of us humans produce, or are projected to produce, in the next 100 years. Ah, it is there. <laughs> Silly things. So, how are we going to solve the problem? What is the remedy? How do we make this happen? How do we save our cities from flooding? How do we save wildlife? <clears throat> How do we actually do it? And then now you've got to look at what is the problem and how you solve it. So, rewilding is obviously a solution because rewilding allows us to manage land and to create flood stores 
It allows us to stop, uh, to stop the, the water flooding off our uplands and all of our marginal land that we don't need to um, farm and it allows us to manage that land well with very little cost, very little human involvement. So rewilding and then in the, in the floodplains they need to become beaver habitat and wetlands. We need to stop agricultural subsidies. The mad idea that I have to work hard and everybody at Wildwood Trust have to work hard. Our charity has to pay that on what we buy. We have to pay national insurance for everybody who works for us and we have to pay income tax. These taxes are mad because you're suppressing work, you're suppressing jobs, you're, you're taxing people to pay people to destroy nature. That's what we're doing. We're, we're taxing people in a way that destroys jobs, that creates poverty, that hurts society, to then use that money to destroy nature and actually make our futures worse. And that's what government policy essentially is. A lot of people don't want to admit that to themselves because it's such a harsh thing to say. It's such, a, it's such a blindingly obvious thing to me. But so many conservationists just want to shy away from that, that core question that we as society are funding people to destroy nature for no benefit. And we're doing it by creating poverty and unemployment. Think about it. So what, what are the solutions? How do we solve this conundrum? Well, there's a very simple economic way. We need to have an economic system that allows us to have rewilded land, rewilded land at no cost to the taxpayer. We need marginal land, that, that land that actually takes subsidy for people to work it, to come out of production and to go back to the wild. And the way, and we need to stop all this subsidising of the destruction of our environment through fossil fuel use, through the overuse of natural resources, pesticides, whatever. And the simple way to do that is to stop taxing incomes, to stop taxing trade, and move that same amount of tax and put it onto the value of land and the value of natural resources. So the land and the natural resources become more costly to use. But it doesn't hurt our society. We're already paying these taxes. Why not just shift them? And then they can fund all the wonderful things that we need, like hospitals and schools and roads and things to make our lives better and to protect our children and educate them. But we now know that every single human being, as they play a part in the economy, are actually searching out ways to use less natural resources, ways to use land in efficient ways that doesn't destroy nature. And by having this tax shift, the floodplain, the uplands will come out of production and we will have beautiful nature reserves to bequeath to our children. And that's how I think we'll solve the problem. Thank you very much, Peter. Are you happy to answer some questions? Of course, if you want me to answer questions now. Yeah. No, um, whenever you were talking about the uh, the blue zone and really just the conics to it, to the black karma, the blue karma, yeah, the blue room, the blue room, that's it. Yeah, right. room. Um, and you said that uh, that to, to prevent those climax communities forming would would mm -hmm. help um, solve flooding. Yes. Like, how does that actually like, operationally work? I thought it's, 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 it's the complexity of the vegetation and the soil structure acts as more of a sponge and therefore slows water down and absorbs more water. So the peaty soils can absorb more water, immobilise it. You're looking at vegetation structures to immobilise the water as it comes down the river. Okay. And um, so like woodland wouldn't do that as well? As it wouldn't do it as well, no. It wouldn't absorb as much water. So it would, it would it, I mean, you could physically occupy, the, land. the water can occupy the land, but it won't be as mobile, immobilized as much. Okay, yeah. Um, with the idea about um, the agriculture, there's, I guess there's a reason why agriculture is encroaching on floodplains and um, 
and is becoming more intensified, and that's because human population is increasing. And we, we need that agriculture, and that's also why it's subsidised. So it's very easy, I guess, from our conservationist viewpoint to say we shouldn't subsidise agriculture and we should leave those areas for um, for nature. But where would you move the agriculture? Uh, Okie dog. Um, it, it is a very good question. The, the answer I've got to you um, was best um, done in a wonderful book by a, a friend of ours called Dr. Duncan Pickard, who's a farmer up in Scotland. We effectively, we actually produce more calories than we consume in this country, um, a lot more, and we export a lot of calories. But we import monstu from Kenya, kiwi fruits, or whatever. So we've got an a very inefficient system. In this country, we waste two thirds of the food we produce. Doesn't actually consume. Um, so, and we have great inefficiency in many farmers, actually inefficient farmers, because there's so much money to be made by subsidies, and um, you know why should they work hard at farming? The economic system I proposed would basically use it or lose it. If you don't work it hard, you're going to lose it. You'll have to give it to somebody who can actually work it more efficiently. So the, the mere title of owning land becomes less important than it is today. That is kind of happening with farm management projects. But the human population, we are not, it's not that we're running out of food. The problem we've got today is how that food is distributed. We have got a billion people starving, but that's not because we don't have enough food, it's because we have an, inc an increasing unequal distribution of wealth between the haves and the have-nots. And it's to say that you can't have nature, we're going to destroy our children's future because we want to keep the haves in such ridiculous lifestyles that they have today and still not feed the poor. Because having rewilded habitats around the world will actually protect the poor. Most of the poor are, are dispossessed. They have lost the benefits of natural um, of water quality, of the land. And so when you have flood alleviation, when you have quality habitats that are given equally or freely, and that's one of the systems of taxing land, is what you're effectively saying is the ground rent of land belongs to everybody. And so everybody will benefit, everybody will have their incomes lifted, you'll have more jobs, you'll have more um, quality of life for the poorest people and they will have access to the, the, the wonderful bounty that is the earth which can provide for seven billion people. You'll also find, I should imagine, by equalizing wealth distribution it's one of the best ways of producing population. What are the factors in, in increasing population? Um, when you look at them it's often it's people who are scared, people who have got no basis. When people have good quality education, economic security, a good quality government, you find that populations study themselves out. Beautifully written by a wonderful chap called Henry George back in the 1870s, observed this fact as an antithesis to the, um, to the writings of uh, Thomas Malthus. And generally, lots of people go on this Malthusian idea that we're running out of natural resources, and it's rubbish, we're not been proved time and time again. It is dis distribution of the natural resources of the planet that are the problem, not the total amount of natural resources we have. Um, in terms of the idea of um, increasing the, the sort of tax on land, um, it's one of the thoughts I had on that is how, if, if you start um, increasing the, so to, to make a piece of land economical, you're going to have to farm it very intensively, like you said. Would that not create a system where you get some land very intensely, the, the, only, the only land use that could be sustainable economically with very intense land use? Would that not increase the problem in some areas? Obviously, there would be some areas which are not economical at all. But the, the ones that are, you would just get these sort of big corporations farming them even more intensely? I don't think so, because when you look at the productivity of land, it is often, with a land tax, you're increasing the amount of labour they could be put onto that land. And so you'll go away. The, the land tax would actually reduce mechanised farming and look at other ways. This, you know, my granddad's allotment was a damn sight more productive than the most productive farmer's field we have today. 
And that's because you put labour into it. Yeah? If you can put more labour into it, you can get higher productivities and for less inputs. Even in areas where you're going to have high intensity farm use, and we have that already, you're still going to need to protect natural services like flooding and others. You're just going to, it'll naturally tend to push farming onto the most productive areas. It'll also reduce our consumption because so much of farming is wasted in what food is produced, the type of food, how we use that food, that having higher prices will actually reduce our consumption. So we'll have less corn grown that's then fed to pigs and then we eat bacon and we'll have more bread because, or, or more vegetables and because those will be cheaper relatively to meat because of the inefficiencies of creating meat. So we'll all go a little bit more veggie and we'll all go a little bit more. But nobody will be worse off because you're redistributing that land rent to everybody. So everybody is getting an uplift from not having a poverty trap uh, where if they try to earn money, they start <coughs> losing income because they have to pay tax and not having enough money to fund proper government services. Um, kind of, I guess, linking to what you just said that um, the model you've kind of suggested seems was to want to take money from intensive agriculture and give it more towards kind of conservation. No. But I'm just wondering if you, if you think there's something to be said for kind of encouraging, it seems to be what you're suggesting, encouraging more um, a move towards more kind of almost subsistence style farmings and um, like small smaller landholders um, kind of there's, there's moves in permaculture and yep. to try and, and the problem is the land styles. how do you get a hold of the land the system I propose will make it easier for people to create permaculture farms to because the land will be cheaper to get a hold of and it will be, you'll have more you'll have more um, movement of land ownership and it will fall into the hands of people who are more productive. Um, but you won't tax farms. I mean, to land, the, the land value capture is capturing towns and cities. Agricultural land has got nothing compared to towns and cities. So the idea that, that to say that we're going to tax farmers is actually not quite true at all. It's, it's, what we're doing is, is if you take you know, the value of the land is all in towns and cities. There's more value in the farmer's house than the whole of his land. So his taxation will be based more on the fact that he's got a nice house, or if he rents that house, he can get that back, than actually the land. When you look at the economics, we're not taxing agriculture. We're just creating a system that will push agriculture to become more efficient and stop abusing nature as much. Do you, do you also have any idea of the sort of um from any models you run, the extent to which the extent of area that we would need to try and rewild. You know, is it just the sort of near around the riverbanks, some of the uplands, or is it much more widespread? Oh, it's widespread. There's wonderful examples of rewilding habitat. Wonderful chap called Charlie Burrell, who's he's um, he's a baronet, I believe, and he's got the Nep estate in Sussex. And that area is just a normal area of land, but it's very clear it's not really good for agriculture. And he's brought that out production and he's he's getting planning permissions for a few rural businesses on the side he gets lots of state support and he's incredibly wealthy so he's been able to do a rewilding project and he's shown that the economics of his estate nice three and a half thousand acres is far better doing this because the land was just so poor so by using an economic model to push unproductive land to becoming it, that reduces its impact on the rest of us. And if you look at it, it's about 40% of the UK could easily come out of production, right? It's not that much use as farmland. In fact, it costs money to farm it. We have to give subsidies, otherwise it wouldn't be farmed. So about four, but you don't need it. And we would need some kind of planning because obviously with nature, you need to create a nature grid, as the Dutch people call it, echo corridors for large mammals to move about because you have to understand the population. Once you look into rewilding and it's true it's sense, you've got to look at the population dynamics of animals. So you'd want to have a web with corridors between your areas of high biodiversity and they could be across the whole of the country focusing on areas that aren't any good for farming. Sorry, um, I was wondering if then 
if rewilding is such a good potential strategy in the UK, if mm -hmm. you could comment on the introduction of top carnivores as well, because obviously um, we have quite a corporate ecosystem here, and there yes, is a lot to say for reintroducing large carnivores like wolves and lynx, and you get really interesting tripartite effects with them and the beavers and the deer, for example. Um, so do you think that that could possibly be an option in the future in the UK as well? Do you think that would ever happen, having wolves I think back here? I'm obviously involved in the debate on lynx reintroduction, mm -hmm. um, and it's one of our charity's objectives. And we'd like to see wolves as well but we'll focus on lynx. Lynx are the perfect example. Many of the problems we've got today, especially in Scotland, but even in Sussex and other areas, parts of Oxfordshire, you've got too many deer. Nobody shoots them anymore. It's too hard. You actually need skill to shoot an animal. So, and uh, most of the hunters today um, feel that shooting a driven pheasant towards them is quite difficult, so they haven't got the skills to actually shoot them. Yeah. Um, so, uh, it's, it's rather a deep corporate hunting population in this country, is, is one of the problems. Do you mean in terms of deer? Because if there's, surely if there's a lot of deer, that's a lot of prey for a predator. It is, and that's why we need, you're absolutely right, we need to have lynx, because lynx will not only, when you study the population dynamics, kill a few deer, they also spread them out, so you get the, all the, the, the Caledonian forest of Scotland has come back, why are we losing the wild cat, why are we losing so many species, it's because we've got too many deer, they're too high a population, they're eating all the regrowth and we need to get rid of them, if people can't shoot them we should introduce the lynx, the lynx is not a danger to humans, and you know, there's, there's wolves probably about, I get my bearings, 300 miles in that direction in France, living today. There's wolves being seen in Denmark. There's wolves being seen in the Netherlands. They are around. And wolves, how many people have they killed? Virtually not. So, but that's probably a step too far politically. The next big stage for most of the rewilders, of, uh, which I work with, mm -hmm. is to get the links into Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, there's plans well advanced with a number of researchers, ecologists, uh, trying to apply for a license to the SNH. It won't be granted because I know people in those there. But, you know, we only got the beaver license to do Ham Fen through political shenanigans, force, and hard work, mm -hmm. and it took a number of times to do it. And special little meetings with ministers and all other things. These, and that's what we're going on with our beaver reintroduction of Wales. We're, we're quietly plotting building alliances, getting the right people to know. And one day we will see lynx, and lynx will do wonders for our ecology. And with I'm lazy, I don't want to have to go and shoot animals. What happens if we rewild, and I've got me bison and me wild horses, and I've got me elk? I, I don't want to shoot, I don't want to shoot. You've got to do it if you rewild it, but it's horrible. Yes. Go ahead, things. So why not get an animal to do it for you? Yeah, so just going back to what you said about the wetlands earlier then. If you if you reintroduced a uh, top carnivore into an environment like that, you would then have the potential for it to success to a woodland because you'd be reducing the herbivore densities there. You're, you're looking so at the population. Do you think that would be good? Or, of course it would. Yeah. Of course it would but be. But you said brilliant. that a wetland would be a better for prevention habitat than a woodland would be. Yes, but it doesn't mean you can't have both. Okay. We're talking in the context of flood prevention. If yeah. you're talking in the context of creating wonderful, rich, wild habitats, of course you want them. Yeah. The best example of this is um, the chap who uh, I once visited at uh, Ustvaras Plus, and Hans Kampf, who did that wonderful work in Pripyat in Chernobyl. And he's, and he's there's some wonderful researchers in there who studied the, the amazing rewilding. Beavers have recreated the Pripyat marshes. Unbelievable. Uh, rich um, habitats have been created and the wolves have come in and they've done where beavers basically are supplying the wolves with most food. 60% of a wolf's diet of the wolves in the Pripyat marshes are beavers. So, and, and that keeps the beavers in check because obviously if you, if you start reintroducing things like wild horses or whatever, what happens when they start munching too much? Yeah. It doesn't work. It's got to be balanced. We are trying to recreate, we're trying to rewild not just shove some animals in, yeah? yeah? Then they'd be no better than sheep. I'm sorry, I was going to start the talk, but I don't know if, you, um, if there are any differences in terms of managing uh, where it works obviously with uh, sea level rise, say we have in, if you're getting constant um, permanent change in the level of uh, water in the area, and what, 
you kind of bring wildly watching as a conservation officer and there because you're not dealing with a, a you know an annual flooding. It's more that the water is constantly encroaching, and also it's because because it's salt water. I assume that affects the kinds of uh, or limits the kinds of ecosystems you can actually uh, establish there. And does that affect the the possibilities of management? Um, yes, yes, and yes. I should imagine. I've been involved in a couple of managed retreats. Um, we run a, one of the ways I fund our charities, I run a consultancy um, company um, on water voles and, and things like that. And we've done a couple of managed retreats with the EA. Um, and I've looked at them. And management retreats just means you're going to take down the flood defences. So flood defences on the sea flood defences, sea walls, are going to become increasingly um, costly to maintain. And you've got the same problem. Um, there's a number of nature reserves I'm working with some people to purchase and to uh, rewild that are essentially um, farmland that is just too high salination behind flood walls that will be eventually breached. The trouble is everywhere's got a couple of houses and these people don't want to lose their houses and we sure can't afford to buy the houses off them. Uh, but people are doing this, the Environment Agency and um, Norfolk Wildlife Trust, uh, Essex Wildlife Trust has done a really nice one. Um, so management, we need to work with nature and not against nature. We don't, as I said, need the land. Spend that much money to have a bit of farmland that's not high quality is stupid. So we have to, you can't stop the sea level rises if they really are. So you need to have managed realignment. You need to retreat humanity from the, the seashore, allow it to inundate. And of course, if you look at some of the rarest habitats, the habitats we've most lost the most of, um, salt marshes is probably one of the most destroyed habitats in the UK. And it's a wonderful buffer. If we, if we go for the big solution, one of the things I always say is, I want to be a conservationist of gelignite. And that's because apparently gelignite is the most environmentally friendly explosive. And I need about two trucks of gelignite. And if you know Kent, you'll know that the island of Thanet used to be a, an island. And they put flood defences. And the Wonsome Channel used to be all sea. And now it is intensively farmed land. But because you've then destroyed the salt marshes that used to be there, along the Kent and the Essex coast, when you get your storm surges coming down the North Sea and you get high rains coming down the Thames meeting together to flood London, how are you going to save London? Well, if you go and blow the flood defences at either side of the Wonson Channel and go and breach the flood defences along the North Kent coast, where we've got some lovely conics grazing around there, and you do it on Essex, they will act as a giant sponge on a giant scale, just like we've been talking about, to absorb those storm surges and actually stop us having to spend another £400 billion on the next Thames barrier that they're planning to do, some unfathomable amounts of £40 billion. It's a, it's a stupefying amount of money they're going to spend on the next Thames barrier. Well, why not breach these flood defences and have a natural absorber of these storm surges? So we could save money and we could have loads of lovely breeding waders and all the lovely salt marsh species. There's nothing, I've got nothing against salt marsh. Lovely habitat. Thanks a lot. I think, do you want to Yeah, yeah. Um, I just like to you and I hear you speak as well the salt answer solution in terms of what needs to happen. It seems quite simple. But then so of the how in terms of if if it seems like such a common sense solution, then what is it that is preventing greed? <laughs> you see, every human wants to be in a position to receive income without work. We all want to be on state benefits. We all want to have a lovely research grant where we don't have to do much work. We all don't want to work for a living. So that has permeated our culture over centuries, over thousands of years, whereby those people who have title to land can receive the rents of those land or the rents of those natural resources for doing not a lot of work. And they will fiercely defend that income. And that's why many of them become politicians and prime ministers, because they've built their wealth 
upon the rents of land, not real income. It's, it's other people's work. They're parasites living on the backs of people who truly work. Landowners, and I know many landowners are the most wonderful people, who are the most intelligent people. It's not, I'm not attacking the people, I'm attacking the system. And the system is, we have created a system where parasitic class claims most of the wealth of the world for doing no work. And that system is ingrained. A lot of these people don't know this. There's a fantastic speech written on the, by this by Winston Churchill who covers this very topic. And he talks about landowners being wonderful people, but they don't know the damage they're doing. That the, the system we have is naturally killing off our planet. And we have to change that system. So we need enough people to educate themselves as what are the problems of environmental destruction and the solutions. And a lot of people are running around saying we need to do this, we need to have this government protocol. It's not doing anything until you tackle the problems. We can never put in the water frames directive. We can never enact our legislation to save wildlife because we can't get access to the land. It's too expensive. If I raise a million pounds to buy a nature reserve, the landowner will just put the price up. And that's the thing that got me into economics when I started out in the Wildlife Trust. I was raising lots of money. I got very good at raising money. Every time I raise some money, you go to the land and you say, oh, it's going to cost an extra thousand quid an acre, mate. Because they have it all in their favour. Land rent extraction tips it all round, puts the natural resources, it conserves natural resources, and allows people to use the land wisely. And we have to tackle that culture of privilege. And we see that now in Britain, in cities across the world, who've adopted the same economic structures we have today, today in land price speculation. It's not house price speculation, it's land price speculation. The whole economic system is going to go, it's going to collapse at some stage because we're all speculating on the price of land. The banks, the whole finances system. Most of our MPs have probably got buy-to-let properties. Everybody's speculating on the monopoly of land and nobody's working anymore. And we need to turn that around. The young people of today, which you represent, have to go out there and say, I'm gonna work for my living. I'm not gonna live on the backs of others. And I don't want my political system to be a bunch of parasites living on the backs of others. I want us to work for a living and I want to protect natural resources. Thank you very much.